Exploding moons, exorcist moms, and bowling. This show has it all, and as the handler says... I do think an explanation of sorts is owing. You got that damn right. So in this video, we're going to take a look at Netflix's The Umbrella Academy, starting with a deep dive into the ending and finishing up with some other cool details you may have missed. Now, if you want to skip ahead and take a look at what I'll be covering, I've left time links in the description. Just don't jump too far in time, or you could end up like this. The final episode begins with a flashback that simply says long ago, yet the spaceships and futuristic atmosphere suggest it's in the future. That is, unless this isn't Earth. According to the graphic novels, of which this show is based off, Reginald Hargreaves is actually an extraterrestrial. Steve Blackman, the showrunner, said we'll learn more about Hargreaves' past next season, so for now we can only speculate. He says goodbye to his love, whose death may somehow be involved with why everyone on this planet is leaving. It's likely this planet is dying or facing its own apocalypse. She gives him her violin, which is later given to Vanya, which in turn becomes the White Violin. In the comics, Vanya's villain codename is the White Violin, and it also happens to be the title of the final episode. Will Vanya still be a villain? And why did they take her with them? As number five explains, the apocalypse will always happen, and Vanya will always be the cause unless they take her with her and fix her. So it looks like next season will focus on helping Vanya harness her power, fixing her, with the hopes of preventing the apocalypse once and for all. Back to Reginald, we see him collect a mysterious jar of floating dust. Now you may have missed it, but there's a cut here which suggests a bit of time has passed after he says his goodbyes and that she is likely dead here. The showrunner hasn't disclosed what this is, but to me it seems symbolic of letting one's ashes go. Probably would have been better with some wind. Perhaps it is her spirit being set unto the universe, and how cool would it be if there were 43 of those floating sprites in there, the same amount of children who miraculously were born that fateful day in October of 1989. Reginald is suddenly in 1928 Earth with no money to his name. You can see he's taking a ship on third class. Mr. Dawson is joining us from the third class. If he is, indeed, from another planet with more advanced technology, he likely used this to his advantage on Earth. Earth to become the billionaire that he is, creating breakthroughs in biology like Pogo or technology like Robot Mom. It's when he arrives in the new city that he buys an umbrella shop, which will later become the Umbrella Academy. And there's great juxtaposition with the founding of the Academy, followed by Vanya completely destroying it. Vanya was locked in what's known as an anechoic chamber, a chamber devoid of any sound. Since her power relies on harnessing sound and converting it into energy, this is the perfect cell for her. But what Reginald and the others didn't take into account was that the anechoic chambers are said to be so quiet that you can hear your own heartbeat. Vanya then uses the sound of her heart to completely destroy the iron door that previously held her inside. She has been taken over by the trauma of her past. We get a brief glimpse of her alongside two younger versions of herself, both of whom harbor extreme resentment for their father and siblings. Vanya then experiences flashbacks of how badly her siblings treated her, treating her as an outsider because she wasn't special like them. To go on a mission, Vanya? You have to have a power. It's this resentment that causes her to completely destroy the Academy, Pogo, her mother, and the world along with her. It's here we also get a glimpse of how much further Klaus's powers can go. For most of the season, Klaus's powers have been suppressed because he can't fully harness them while under the influence of drugs and narcotics. Now that he's sobered up, he can harness the power of his dead brother, Ben, who saves Diego from a falling piece of debris. Now Ben is interesting because we never really see how he died. We do know that it was when he was younger because of the statue in the gardens, which means that when number five teleports the family and we see them as their younger selves, it's entirely possible that Ben will be alive and well in the upcoming season. Even cooler is that Klaus can allow Ben to manifest himself in reality, using his tentacle powers to make quick work of the Commission's henchmen. Now we can guess these goons are from the Commission because of the gas mask, which we get a brief glimpse of in Episode 6. Now with Vanya on the loose, the gang decides to hit the lanes where they find out Vanya is scheduled to play her final performance that will unleash the apocalypse at the Icarus Theater. Icarus being a fitting name, a reference to the Greek myth of Icarus overestimating the extent of his powers, flying too close to the sun and dying in the process. Much like how Vanya's powers will lead to her own destruction. You'll also notice the name of the 
chamber orchestra, St. Pluvium, Pluvium Latin for rainy, the only thing to stop it, an umbrella, of course. Also, these dudes were totally here for Kenny's birthday. Maybe they're here for Kenny's birthday! A nice little detail that I totally loved is that the Umbrella Academy are still wearing their bowling shoes in the final scene. We also have the matter of Cha-Cha and Hazel. Hazel decides to kill Cha-Cha in a freak car crash so he can be with his love, Donut Lady Agnes. But Cha-Cha doesn't die, instead going on to continue her mission of protecting Vanya, because if she can protect Vanya, she'll make sure the apocalypse is successful and get her retirement. Now, it's also important to note why this apocalypse is happening in the first place. The commission, whose purpose is to make sure the timeline is kept intact, has deemed that this is necessary. But why? Doesn't this mean the end of everything? But as the handler says, Not everything. Just the end of something. So we never really get a solid answer on that. Hazel rushes back to Agnes and immediately kills the Handler without any words. Not like the Handler would care anyway since back in episode 5 when number 5 has a gun pointed at her, she says she'll just be replaced by another. So next season we can probably expect a new foe from the commission. But Hazel isn't going in without a backup plan. He has a briefcase hidden in the air duct just like he did in episode 2. This briefcase will allow him and Agnes to warp just moments before the apocalypse. Whether or not they've gone to live happily ever after or will appear next season is still unknown. Chacha, on the other hand, has a final battle with Diego, and it's fitting it's with him because Diego learned Chacha was the one who pulled the trigger on his love, Detective Eudora Patch. But with Chacha's life in his hands, he decides to spare her, thinking of Eudora, who he loved because she always saw the good in people, that people can change. But it's kind of all for naught since she just dies a minute later anyway. You can also see her likely attempting to call the commission who isn't answering. Uh, I'm sorry, Michael's not here right now. And finally we have the climactic battle between Vanya and the other members of the Umbrella Academy. They decide to all attack her at the same time in the hopes of knocking her out of her trance. Allison is the only one who's successful and aims the gun at her head. But instead of shooting her, she aims off to the side. Because Vanya's powers are reliant on sound, the gun blast causes her to release all her energy upward to the moon, which consequently crumbles and rains apocalyptic rock on Earth. And with nowhere to go, number five suggests he transport them all through time which actually works. We see them transform back to children, suggesting they may go back to a time where their father is still alive, and finally get some answers from him. But since we now know number 5 has this power, it leaves endless possibilities for where next season could take us. And it looks like Cha-Cha, Detective Beeman, and Sergeant Cheddar didn't make it out alive. But notice how Cheddar here is reading the same magazine Allison picked up about her family earlier on in the season. And with the timeline potentially being reset, who knows who, what, or where next season will take us. Now we're going to jump into some small details and questions you may have missed. The Umbrella Academy logo contains the words ut malum pluvia, which roughly translates from Latin to when evil reigns. You'll see the umbrella in the top left, which protects from the rain on the right, symbolized by the lightning. The bottom right is the mask representing the Umbrella Academy, which protects from evil on the left, the skull. Little is known about Pogo's backstory other than he was created by Reginald Hargreaves. In episode one, Pogo tells the family that Reginald made him who he was today, and he would forever be in his debt. My guess is that there's a link between Pogo and the serum which Hargreaves used to save Luther after the biological attack. After all, when Luther offers to give his blood to Allison, Pogo says Luther can't because he has more in common with his blood than with humans. Number five story is one of the more interesting. In defiance of his father, he traveled through time and accidentally stumbled on the apocalypse and couldn't get back. There he toiled for years until saved by the handler, who allowed him to travel via the briefcases in exchange for completing hits. This allowed him time to work on his calculations until he was ready to travel back. But his calculations were wrong and he came back as a kid, but with the knowledge of the decades he spent in solitude. One of the more interesting aspects of number five was when he was tasked to kill President John F. Kennedy. In fact, that's exactly what he was tasked to do right before he conjured the temporal portal, which brought him back in episode one. But did he go through with it? If you play back the scene, you'll notice the gunshot sound occurs after he's made his way through the portal. So no, in this timeline, he did not. I shot the beard right down from a grassy knoll near the street 
where the motorcade was moving. Luther lives on the moon because his father told him to. Luther would do anything for his dad since he was fiercely loyal. He was the last one to leave the Umbrella Academy. His loyalty got him into the condition he's in today, and he later finds out that his father never even read the reports he was assigned to deliver. For Reginald, sending Luther to the moon was the only way to give Luther purpose after his horrific accident. And yes, that's very messed up. As you take away. Oh, wow. Yeah, of course it is. Not Klaus has a really weird scene in which he supposedly talks to God in the form of a young girl. This actually happens in the comics, but God is depicted as a grizzled cowboy riding a horse. Showrunner Steve Blackman stated that even the writers couldn't decide whether or not that's actually God, so we're shit out of luck getting an answer for that. Last but not least, how on earth did 43 women magically give birth in a day? Well, this is never explained in the show, but the comics hint that the 43, collectively, are the modern-day reincarnation of the Messiah. Whether or not the show will delve further into this is unknown, but with 43 born and the show only focusing on 7, I wouldn't be surprised if more of these children show up in Season 2. I hope you enjoyed this video. Make sure to Luther smash that like button, and I heard a rumor that if you subscribe with the bell on, you'll get more great videos. I also have a Twitter where you can get in touch with me and get the latest on what I'm working on. Until next time, remember, Daddy loves you very much.